Good morning, family of God across the earth. J.P. Greer here from Sentinels for Christ for SFC 15 in the Word on December 11th, 2023. We are in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and I hope that you're um, excited about our study today. I think that you're going to like it. And we march through the Bible here um, twice a week at SFC 15 in the Word on Mondays and Fridays. Um, Mondays so that you can start off your week with a good message because some of you may live in a place where it's hard for you to get the church. We get that. And then we also want to give you another message um, as you head into your weekend because many people, um, it just works as a really good reset for them to keep their mind and focus on where they're going into the weekend. Um, as they head into celebrating the Lord's Day with God's people on Sunday or perhaps Saturday evening, wherever they do that. So you are guaranteed at Sentinels for Christ um, to twice a week get a biblically based uh, message that is going to focus on Jesus no matter what we do. And with that, we have been able to enjoy um, the, the opportunity to continue to tell many of you about Jesus, to present the gospel, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ to many, many people. In fact, over the last several years, that, is, that number has really gone to several thousand people. And just in the last 30 days alone, um, we have been able to reach uh, through our broadcasts close to 600,000 people about Jesus. And isn't that an exciting thing to do? Because at any time of the year, that's exciting. But particularly at this time of the year, because Christmas, at least in most of Western culture, is the uh, time that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Really, the remarkable circumstance that God did when he decided to send his son in the form of a human being. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today because it is actually related to the prayer in the 14th chapter of Mark that Jesus prays. But before we do that, my favorite time is welcoming some of our new people who follow us with which I need to use my glasses to do that. <clears throat> and from the country of Burundi, I want to welcome uh, Beya Senji. And in Burundi, we have a uh, prayer school and some prayer ministries. It's just awesome to see people from Burundi um, uh, checking us out there, and we welcome you. Also from Ethiopia, I want to welcome Quirasio. And Quirasio, thank you. And from Bangladesh, Sheik, we welcome you as well. And do you think it's only three? No. And the 184 other people since Friday who've decided to follow Sentinels for Christ. So we're going to make you that continual promise that if you follow us, we're not going to put a whole bunch of stuff on there to ask for your money, um, to manipulate you, or to try and do things that that will break your faith. We're going to do what I found is, is the best thing that I can possibly do, and that is to saturate my mind accurately about um, the reality of who Jesus Christ is. And I find that when I do that, a lot of the things that I think are really important in life that divert me, that distract me, well, they kind of get um, put in the right place. And I start living a better life of faith in Christ and certainly being more effective. So we're going to focus on that here at Sentinels for Christ. And um, we hope that you're blessed. We have a great week <clears throat> for a couple reasons, okay? Today, we're going to be partnering with a, a sister, Estelle Humphreys, um, from one of our, 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 our partnership ministries. We're going to be teaching on the issue of covering um, or, or proper authority and leadership in the church. And I will be putting up uh, later this week, um, probably as a link both on Wednesday night and Friday, uh, a link to that teaching. So if any of you are wondering how to assess authority in a church, um, and what type of authority to follow, this is really going to bless you because there is, I tell you what, there's a lot of nonsense out there. There always has been. Um, it's never gone away since the beginning of time. We want to make sure that uh, we're doing what the Apostle Paul says. The Apostle Paul told the people who he wrote his letters to, follow me as I follow Christ. He didn't say follow people. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. But on Wednesday, we've got one of our Wednesday koinonias. We're going to be getting together with a local assembly here, New Hope Fellowship, with Pastor Mitch and his people praying over our region. So you can see how to do that for your region. And Brother Larry, uh, he'll be bringing a, a message also on 
um, on Vision, and we hope that you'll be excited. That will be posted too. So it's really quite an exciting week here at Sentinels for Christ. But let's get to the Word of God. We are in the 14th chapter of Mark where there's a lot that happens in this chapter, okay? But we've gone um, into the upper room of Jesus where he held the last Passover supper. They finished that. Last time we were together, we talked a lot about the significance of the Passover supper, why Jesus celebrated it, and why he is so connected to it. So you can check out that message if you want to. You'll be blessed. Um, but after that Passover supper, we're told the following, that Jesus knew that he was going to be arrested that night, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit. And he went out to one of his favorite places, which was the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olivet. Now, this is a place, okay, which is relatively close to Jerusalem. Um, it's east of the city of Jerusalem, and it was an olive grove where Jesus went many times. He conducted teachings with his disciples there. They probably just hung out, and they certainly prayed there. And that is where um, the disciples got up and went over to after the Passover supper. And it is there that we pick up in the 14th chapter of Mark. So let's read the word of God, have some commentary, and we'll all be blessed in Jesus name. Okay. Then after finishing their meal, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to them, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. And he said, My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. And going a little farther, he fell down to the ground, and he prayed that if it was possible, that the hour might pass from him. We're going to talk about that. Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Then he turned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Simon, he said, couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh, it's weak. And once more he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. They didn't know what to say to him. And returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Here comes my betrayer. And just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest to arrest Jesus with the teachers of the law and the elders. Now, the betrayer had arranged a signal with those who were coming to arrest him and said, the one that I'm going to kiss is the man, arrest him, and lead him away under guard. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And the men seized Jesus and arrest him. Then one of those standing near his sword struck the servant of the high priest who was there, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion that Jesus said that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you didn't arrest me. But this is going to happen so that the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And a young man who was wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Let's talk for a few uh, minutes about the prayer of Jesus. There's a lot to actually say about prayer here in the garden. Um, but there's two real tracks that we could take about it. Um, we could talk about Jesus' actual prayer, which is going to be our emphasis and I think it's really going to bless us um, or we could talk about what he said to Peter which has to be understood really in the context of this the discussion he had with Peter around the uh, Passover table when Peter swore to Jesus hey I won't ever leave you or deny you no matter what these other guys do 
And it's really, if you understand what Jesus said to Peter, then you'll understand what Jesus is saying to Peter at this time um, when he comes back and finds him asleep. But I'm not going to focus on that. I want to focus on Jesus' prayer. I, I want, you know, one of the things that is hard for people to understand because human beings, most human beings believe in the divine. Most human beings believe that the world is simply too complex to have come together uh, as part of a random uh, thing that happened in the universe that nothing caused nothing and things slapped together, caused planets, caused constellations, caused orbits in the planets, which require them to be in mathematical perfect uh, synchronicity for them to maintain galaxies, for them to maintain solar systems. Most people, when presented with that type of evidence about creation itself, um, believe in the divine, believe in God. And most people have an idea of what God is. And he's very far removed. And he is uh, affixed with a lot of the characteristics that simply we don't have in a perfect form. Now, there are also religions that teach some very broken ideas of, of what God is and attribute to him lots of human elements um, which simply are not part of, of who God is. And there's a fancy word for that. It's called anthropomorphism, and it's it's simply not that important. But most people believe in, in, in God. But And what most people have a problem with is that when they set God up in a way of understanding him on a pedestal, the last thing that they would think is God becoming a human being in the form uh, of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And that is really one of the phenomenons that is one of the hardest things to, I think, accept about the Christian faith, but it's also one of the most comforting things. And I'm going to explain why, because it's found in the prayers right here. And by the way, I bless those of you who are who are with us. I see that Stefan's with us. God bless you, Stefan. Um, and Shabazz, I see you as well, too. Um, and I think you're going to be blessed by this. Jesus, being the Son of God, um, it, it is there is a mystery to Jesus that we simply have a hard time understanding. Why in the world would God, if Jesus was who the Bible says he is, the Son of God, why would he come in the form of a human being and do what he did the way he did? Well, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, when we talked about the necessity of Jesus to be the sacrifice um, that ultimately would remedy the problems w with the world, which Jesus does. Um, and that's what the whole Passover meal is about. But there's another part of Jesus that is really easy to miss at this point that comes out from this prayer. And that's that, first of all, Jesus obviously knows what's going to happen. Okay. Again, We've shared sometimes that there are, there are other faiths that try and diminish Jesus because they don't want to believe he's the son of God because if they acknowledge he's the son of God, then their faith means nothing, okay? Because there's one son of God. The only religion that teaches their leader was the son of God is the Christian faith, okay? So re other religions have taught that, that Jesus really stumbled, made a big mistake, got himself crucified, wasn't really aware that what was going to happen. And we see here in the prayer in the garden that that is not the case. That he says clearly as he goes into prayer. And isn't it interesting that the Lord, before this great trial that he knew was coming, what did he do? First of all, he went to prayer. But Jesus facing the trial tells his best friends, Peter, James, and John, the following. Man, my soul is burdened to the point of death. Will you sit here and keep watch with me? Man, that's a prayer request for your friends, right? You ever prayed that for your friends? You ever had someone pray that type of prayer request for you? That they were in such spiritual turmoil that they asked you to keep watch with them. Well, Peter, James, and John don't do that well. They fall asleep, which is understandable because it's late. They've had a big meal and it's just the way it goes. And they had no idea what was coming either. Um... But Jesus takes his best friends along with him, which is very human, isn't it? And he asks them to sit and pray. And then he prays an amazing prayer, knowing that he has to go to the cross, knowing that it's only his blood, that the sacrifice of his blood will remedy the issue between God Almighty and the earth that he created. It will give forgiveness for the problem of rebellion against God, sin. It's only Jesus' blood that does that. He says the following, Dad... 
because the term that he uses in the Greek is this really um, sensitive, beautiful, intimate term um, for God. It's, it's Abba. Some of you know that already, but um, he says, Abba, if this cup can be taken away from me, man, it'd be good if you do that. But not what I wish, but what you wish. And this was such a, a struggling moment for Jesus that in, in Matthew's account of this prayer, where we get the fullest account of the prayer in Matthew, we actually get uh, the best picture of the garden when we look at Matthew's front end, the prayer, and then what happens um, in John's gospel. We find that Jesus actually goes back three times and says the same thing. Do you know it's okay to ask God and wrestle with something repeatedly? I just want to free you up in Jesus' name right now. Sometimes we get crazy ideas about prayer and we think, again, that broken way of thinking about God that, well, he's like this. And, and we forget that he's also very relational, which is why he sent his son to live on earth for three years and interact with people and show people how to live a godly, holy life in faith, following God's commands. And, and that's very relational. And when we put God up and we make him non-relational, we think stuff like this. Well, if I prayed one time, then God's heard it and that should be the end of the deal. And that's not relational. What Jesus did in the garden is relational. He goes back to the Father three times and says, Man, if you can spare me of what I'm going to have to go through, please do it. And then three times he ends with it. Um, but not as I will, but as you, you will. And it's interesting, in Matthew, we actually see the conviction and the change in Jesus' prayer take place a little bit. And that he comes to a place where he's, he is resolute about what is in front of him that is a result of the prayers he prays to God. Let me say what I just said again without the big words, okay? There is a point in prayer where we go and we ask God for something repeatedly because we're struggling with something. We're trying to figure something out. We need clarity. We need breakthrough in something. There's a type of prayer where we go back and forth with God wrestling, okay? And it's in the wrestling that we get the answer and the peace. And we find this in Jesus' prayer. Uh, another really uh, amazing uh, component that, uh, about that, hello, Sister Beatrice, uh, bless you, and I got the message about your cow, and I just bless your kids this morning um, as they deal with uh, the loss of that animal. Another thing about Jesus is I want you to take away is this, because friends, we can get really religious, I can get really religious, and I find one of the great struggles is just to keep this Jesus, who's the Son of God, um, very relational to me and believe the things that he said. And here's one of them, okay? I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, the Bible teaches, okay, um, in the first chapter of, of the, the book of Ephesians that Jesus went to the Father and is seated at his right hand, and he intercedes for us up there. But even in that, Jesus says he is with us always to the end of the age, which means that he's not limited by time, distance, and space. He's with me now as I preach the word of God to you. And it's this relational Jesus that it is accessible. The Bible teaches the following in the fifth chapter of Hebrews. And I just want to read this to you and then comment about it so that we can take a relational Jesus who's the son of God who died from our sins with us into the rest of uh, this week and, and into the rest of this year. Hebrews chapter 5 says something that is so revealing about the humanity of Jesus um, that it's not really, it's not found in any other place in the New Testament. It says during, uh, in verse 7, and Hebrews, it's an amazing book in the New Testament, which not only explains very accurately um, to a Jewish audience, the necessity of Jesus to replace the Jewish religion and how he replaces the ultimate sacrifice, right? But Hebrews links together that work of Jesus being the Son of God with the fact that he lived a human life. And I'll talk about that and I'll, I'll end with that in just a minute. And in chapter 5, verse 7, it says that during the time of Jesus' earthly life, here on earth that um, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him. Wow. It is quite obvious at this point that the writer of Hebrews is thinking about exactly this prayer in the garden when he talks about fervent tears 
passionate tears to the one who could save him. Because Luke's account of this says that Jesus was in such spiritual, emotional agony that for some reason, the blood ruptured in his skin and his, his skin produced uh, blood that actually dripped down and, and fell to the ground. Very strange circumstance, but it's also a medical circumstance, which is a very real circumstance that can happen to people. Hebrews going on says this, he offered these prayers to the one who could save him from death, okay? And he was heard because of his reverent submission. And Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission. So the Father God heard Jesus because his prayers were reverent and they were submissive. They were always authentic. They were always in perfect alignment with God. And here's what Hebrews goes on to say in verse 6. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Let me read verse 8 one more time so that we get end with the commentary on verse 8. So you get what I want to be the food for you to take away today. Okay, Son of God, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Jesus is here in the garden, Mark 14, suffering in agony. Okay, And... Once made perfect, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and he became the source of eternal salvation for those who obey him. Why is that? The law, the need for protection to in accordance with God's standards, because God is holy and perfect, God cannot tolerate the imperfect. Because the imperfect is, you need to receive what I'm going to say here, the imperfect is unholy. Holiness and imperfection in heaven simply is not something that is going to coexist and, and keep continuing and go on to be. So Jesus learned something by his suffering. He learned obedience. Why would Hebrews say that? Because Jesus in his humanity that we've been talking about so deeply during this, this study today, he actually learned what it was like to be human just like you and me, and struggle with obeying. All of us who try and follow the Christian life and allow God to imprint himself upon us have to go through this.